In this video, we continue our discussion on translation and start by understanding the first prokaryotic translation step, which is called the initiation. Before you continue any further, I hope you have watched the introduction videos for translation. In this specific video, we will talk about the E, P, and the A sites and the special initiator tRNA and how multiple initiation factors along with the ribosome subunits and the mRNA come together in different steps to form the pre-initiation complex. And we'll also discuss some key transitions that occur in the pre-initiation complex to transition into initiation complex, which is the last step of initiation. Before we dive into this process, let's keep two very important things clear. First is the mRNA syntax for prokaryotes which starts with the 5' UTR that contains the Shine-Delgarino sequence. Following the 5' UTR, you have a start codon, AUG, which marks the start of a reading frame. And this reading frame then ends at a stop codon. And following the end of a stop codon, you have a 3' UTR sequence. The second key point to remember is the structure of the ribosome, which consists of a small and a large subunit. In prokaryotes, or bacteria specifically, the entire structure is called 70S. If you don't know what this S in the 70S, 50S, and 30S stands for, you should definitely check out the introduction video where I have a detailed explanation. So another key point for ribosome structure is that it has a lot of RNA as its component. And this RNA is called the ribosomal RNA. And this ribosomal RNA is mixed with the proteins to form a functional ribosome. Also, keep in mind that a large percentage of the entire ribosome, around 65%, is actually ribosomal RNA. So by definition, ribosomes are proteins coupled with ribonucleic acids, also called ribonucleic proteins. Let's get a bit concrete on these two considerations. In this 5' UTR, the shine delgarno sequence is about 10 nucleotides away from the start codon. And oftentimes, this entire 5' UTR in prokaryotes is also called the leader sequence. This canonical mRNA 5' UTR can also sometimes be a bit different, such that the 5' UTR does not contain any ribosome binding site. Or sometimes you have a mRNA where the 5' UTR is also so small that it starts with the ribosome binding itself. But these no shine delgarno sequence and small leader sequence mRNAs have a slightly different way of initiating translation. For the sake of our understanding, we'll primarily discuss the translation initiation in the context of this canonical mRNA syntax, which also happens to be the syntax which is most commonly found in mRNAs in prokaryotes. Now on to the second consideration. I will represent the ribosome as this simple cartoon structure but always keep in mind that it has a RNA component. In the fully formed ribosome, there are three major sites at which the translation occurs. These are called the E, P, and A sites. You can split the entire ribosome into small and large subunits, the 50S and 30S, and you will find specific features within these subunits that come together to form the E, P, and the A sites. But E, P, and A sites are catalytically functional only in the 70S ribosome unit, when both large and the small subunit combine together. So, what are these E, P, and A sites? The A stands for the amino acylated transfer RNA binding site. The P stands for peptidyl transfer RNA binding site. That's where the amino acid transfer reaction occurs. And the E stands for the exit site. And this is where the empty transfer RNA is released after the amino acid transfer has occurred. We will discuss each of these sites in much more detail in this video, as well as in the future videos on translation. So just to quickly give you an idea about the translation initiation, you need to assemble the 50S and 30S subunits, where you define the E, P, and A sites, where a starting transfer RNA pairs with the mRNA on the ribosome. And this needs to happen in such a way that the amino acid faces the 50S subunit and the anticodons on the transfer RNA face the smaller subunit and it pairs with the codons on the mRNA. So once again, to make things explicit, the amino acid side of the transfer RNA is buried in the 50S subunit 
and the anticodon and codon pairing occurs in the 30S subunit. Now, let's dive into the process of initiation. Essentially, what we are about to discuss are sequential steps that establish the beginning of the translation process. This begins with the formation of a pre-initiation complex, which is composed of small ribosome subunit. The initiation factors, and there are three of these, and a special initiator transfer RNA form the pre-initiation complex. After this 30S pre-initiation complex has formed, the mRNA binds to it, and this complex then turns into a 30S initiation complex. And to this complex, the large subunit is recruited, and then this finally turns into a 70S initiation complex. And this 70S complex concludes the initiation step of translation. Now that we have covered some fundamentals, let's actually take a deep dive into the crux of the process of initiation in prokaryotes. The process starts with the free 30S subunit of the ribosome, which at this moment does not have any defined E, P, and A sites. The free small subunit is recycled from ribosome that are terminated from the translation process, which frees up the small and the large subunit. The E, P, and A sites are free sites in the beginning, which simply means that E, P, and A sites do not yet exist. They are not defined yet. And actually, the process of initiation helps define the E, P, and A sites. All right. In the next stage, the free subunit gets bound by the initiation factor 3. The initiation factor 3 binds at one end of the 30S subunit, and the position where it binds the small subunit becomes the E site. For your note, the IF3 has many other important functions as well. First, it makes sure that the 70S ribosome does not form prematurely. It helps in the positioning of this special initiator tRNA that we will discuss in a moment. Also, just to go back to this 70S assembly point, what it really means is that initiation factor 3 prevents the binding of 50S subunit to the small subunit. But perhaps the most important point in the initiation factor 3 binding is that it defines the exit site on the ribosome. Now, after the initiation factor 3 has bound, a second initiation factor is recruited to the other side of the small subunit. And this is called initiation factor 2 which is a GTPase, so it carries a GTP with itself. And IF2 helps define the A site of the ribosome. The initiation factor 2 is the largest of the three initiation factors, so big that it contacts the IF3 on the other end of the small subunit. Now this may not look as good when I draw it out, but keep in mind that these interactions are happening in 3D. So, some important points to keep in mind about IF2 is that it interacts with IF3. And because it has this GTPS activity, means that it can produce energy. And towards the end, we'll see initiation factor 2 GTPS activity in action. Now, besides being a GTPS, the other very important role for IF2 is that it can bind to the initiation transfer RNA specifically. This also means that IF2 prevents the binding of all other tRNAs, which are not initiator tRNAs. And IF2 recruitment also moves the initiation stage into the next step by recruiting initiation factor 1. Let's take a minute to logically think about these recruitment of initiation factor. You notice here that IF1 is dependent on IF2 for recruitment onto the small subunit, but IF2 and IF3 they get recruited onto the 30S subunit, and they're not dependent on any other factors. So this IF2 and IF3 recruitment does not have to occur in this specific order. IF2 can also just bind the small subunit independently before the IF3 has a chance. So don't get stuck in this rigid outline of recruitment of initiation factors. All right, let's continue. The IF2 binding has partially defined the A site on the ribosome. The complete definition of the A site depends on the initiation factor 1. The initiation factor 1 binds very closely to initiation factor 2. And this space that is left between the IF3 and IF1 is called the P site. So no initiation factor binds the P site, which means that if an initiator tRNA has to bind, the only spot left for it to bind is at this empty P site between IF3 and IF1. 
Again, to make it explicit, the IF1 blocks the A site, and by doing this, it helps mark the A site in the small subunit. Sometimes the initiator tRNA actually comes in complex with the IF2 GTPase. But if it's not in the complex, it gets recruited independently. Let's draw out this complex and see how it works. So we have the IF3 at one end of the 30S subunit, and IF2 and IF1 on the other end of the subunit. The initiator tRNA interacts with the initiation factor 2 and gets positioned into the empty P site. And this special initiator tRNA carries the methionine at the 3' end. However, this starting initiator tRNA methionine contains a 4 mile group attached to its nitrogen. And this is the special initiator tRNA. It is called N4 mile methionine. And for short, you may write it as FMET tRNA I, where I stands for initiator. Here's one other important point about this initiation step. In this picture, we don't have the mRNA, and yet the tRNA is available. And this is the only point in the entire translation process where a tRNA binds at the P site in the ribosome without mRNA. This is important because, as we have said in introduction, that the mRNA dictates which tRNA should be used. So the mRNA, by definition, should come first and then the tRNA. But this exception exists in the initiation step where the transfer RNA comes before the messenger RNA. Before we go into the next step, let me clarify a few things. Although I have described the process so far in a linear fashion, there's a caveat to how it actually works in reality. The IF2 GTP, as I've said before, sometimes is found in a complex with the initiator transfer RNA, and then it brings the tRNA to the P site. And if IF2 GTP and tRNA bind first, the IF1 is recruited on top of it. But in both ways of recruitment, the final product is the same. And this 30S subunit bound by the initiation factors and the initiator tRNA is called the 30S pre-initiation complex. And this order of recruitment is a kinetically preferred assembly pathway, which starts with the 30S subunit, which is bound by the IF3, and then comes IF2, which may contain the tRNA, and then finally the IF1. Now let's keep going. Recall that the ribosomes have ribosomal RNA as their component, and the 30S subunit has a 16S ribosomal RNA. In this specific 16S ribosomal RNA, there's a sequence that binds the shine delgarno sequence in the mRNA. So this 30S pre-initiation complex recruits the mRNA via this anti shine delgarno sequence and this 16S ribosomal RNA pairs with the mRNA at the shine delgarno sequence. And now, hopefully this makes it clear on why SD sequence is also called the ribosome binding site. Let's actually zoom into this recruitment of mRNA and flesh out some interesting details. As we have seen before, you have the initiation factors bound, and the transfer RNA, which was recruited by the initiation factor 2, is also positioned at the P site because of some interactions with the initiation factor 3 on the other side. Now the 16S ribosomal RNA has this anti shine sequence, which is typically AGG, AGG, and this pairs with UCC, UCC sequence on the mRNA. This short sequence is a consensus shine sequence, which is present on the mRNA. Here's another interesting thing about this placement. Around 10 nucleotides downstream of the shine delgarno sequence on the mRNA, you typically find the AUG, which is the starting codon. And this initiator tRNA pairs with the AUG codon via the anticodon UAC. And now we get a complete complex of 30S subunit, which is called the 30S initiation complex. Now, just to go over this again, because this is very important to understand. In this complex, we have the A site, which is defined by initiation factor 1 and 2. The P site is defined by the initiator tRNA. And the E site is defined by the initiation factor 3. Now after the formation of this complex, the initiation factor 3 moves a little more towards the edge because of the pairing between the tRNA and the mRNA at the start codon. And this movement of initiation factor 3 causes a conformational change in the initiation complex. And this gives 
50s subunit a green light to bind to this 30s subunit. And when the 50s subunit binds to the 30s initiation complex, the IF3 is released from the 30s subunit, and now instead it goes and binds to the 50s subunit. And as a consequence, this E site becomes empty. The initiation factor 1 and 2 are still bound at the A site, and the P site still has the initiator tRNA paired with the mRNA. So how does the 50S subunit know how it should correctly position itself with the 30S subunit? It turns out that the 50S subunit recognizes initiation factor 2 as its docking site. And now as soon as the 50S subunit docks with the 30S subunit, the GTPase activity within the initiation factor 2 gets activated. And as a result, it hydrolyzes the GTP. And this hydrolysis of GTP causes two things to happen in this complex. One, the GTP is hydrolyzed, and the GTP that is contained in the IF2 is reduced to a GDP. And second, because this is an energy producing step, the energy released from the hydrolysis is used to cause a rotational change along the vertical axes of the entire complex, so that the two ribosome subunits can lock into a stable configuration. And this now is called the 70S pre-initiation complex. So now, because of this rotational change, and the fact that IF2 now carries a GDP instead of a GTP, the IF2 GDP loses its affinity for 30S subunit. And as a result, the IF2 is released. And because IF1 interacts closely with the IF2, the IF1 is also released. And if we draw out this new complex, we see that the initiator tRNA is the only thing that is left behind, which by the way is still paired with the messenger RNA at the start codon, and this forms the P site. And the A site is empty, and likewise the E site is also empty. And as we have said before, this first amino acid that is present here is the special 4-mile methionine. In this complex, note that IF2 and IF1 are not present but IF3 still remains attached to the 50S subunit at some non-canonical site. And this is the final 70S initiation complex, which concludes the initiation stage of translation. And now this 70S ribosome is ready for the elongation stage. Before we part our ways, I wanted to leave you with some bonus information. So far in the mRNA syntax, we've said that the AUG is a start codon, which is true. But in some cases, GUG and UUG can also be recognized as the start codon. In bacteria, E. coli being the prime example, 85% of the genes have AUG as their start codon, and 14% have GUG, and a small 3% also use UUG. These numbers don't add to 100 because sometimes two start codons can occur back to back, and that can result in different starting positions of a reading frame. Here's where things get interesting with these codons. If you look at the codon table, you will see that the AUG codes for methionine, the GUG codes for valine, and UUG codes for leucine. But the special thing about the start codon is that if any of these codons occur as a start codon, they always code for methionine, and specifically this formylated methionine. You only have this one initiator tRNA for all these start codons which means that the UAC anticodon not only recognizes AUG, it also recognizes GUG and UUG. Now, you may find this a bit weird, because G pairs with C and U pairs with A, but how can G and U pair with U? The answer to that is that the pairing of U in the first base is done by wobble base pairing. And I will discuss wobble base pairing and other types of base pairing mechanisms in a separate video. And this completes our fairly comprehensive discussion on the initiation of translation in prokaryotes.